Welcome to this webinar on Win, Lose, or Draw, Assessing the EU-UK Trade Agreement. To help us think about this question, we have a distinguished panel with wide international experience and expertise in Europe, Ireland, uh, and the challenging relationship uh, between Ireland and the UK. Thank you very much for joining us uh, today. We've had 100 people sign up. You can participate via the, the, the chat or, or Q&A if you like. This session is jointly sponsored by the Moore Institute at NUI Galway and by the MA in Public Policy. Uh, I'm Daniel Carey, Director of the Moore Institute, uh, and Professor Neil O'Doherty, who runs the MA. Uh, we were discussing the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement, as it's known, in the, early in the new year. And we realized that, in, oh, although there's been a great volume of press coverage, that we still had many questions to ask about it and trying to understand you know, how, how things transpired, how things worked out. Uh, who gave ground, who gained ground, whether there was an area of consensus in all of this, trying to size up the negotiations. And obviously the relationship between Ireland, North and South is critical in all of this. Since then, of course, the protocol has become inflamed as an issue. And just yesterday, the British government announced a unilateral decision to extend the grace period for agri-food agri movement between mainland Britain and Northern Ireland. A decision that this morning, Simon Coveney uh, questioned uh, in, in raising whether the EU is working with a partner it can trust. So we have much to consider today. I'll introduce our panelists in alphabetical order. Uh, Katie Hayward is Professor of Political Sociology in Queen's University of Belfast and a Senior Fellow of the UK in a Changing Europe, uh, the think tank which is, is led to, had such a prominent role in discussions. She leads a major project for them on the future and status of Northern Ireland after Brexit. She is a leading expert on Brexit, particularly with respect to the Irish border, and she has presented and uh, written and provided oral evidence before several parliamentary committees and policy groups in the UK, Ireland, the EU, and the US. She's the author of over 200 publications, and her book on the Irish border for SAGE is due out in June. Professor Hayward is an Eisenhower Fellow, and in 2019, she was awarded the title of Political Communicator of the Year from the Political Studies Association. David O'Sullivan served as ambassador of the European Union delegation to the United States from November 2014 to February 2019. Prior to his appointment as ambassador, he was the chief operating officer of the EU's new diplomatic service, the European External Action Service. He had previously held a number of senior positions within the European Commission, including Director General for Trade from 2005 to 2010, Secretary General of the European Commission 2000 to 2005, and Chief of Staff to Commission President Romano Prodi, 1999 to 2000. Before he joined the Commission, he started his career with the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade from 1977 to 79. He's a graduate of Trinity College Dublin and the College of Europe, and holds honorary doctorates from the Dublin Institute of Technology and Trinity College Dublin. He was awarded the EU Transatlantic Business Award by the American Chamber of Commerce in 2014. In November 2019, he joined the Brussels office of the law firm Steptoe and Johnson LLP as a senior counselor. Carlo Troyan's long career with the European Commission included the role of chief of staff of Franz Andreessen, vice president of the European Commission, dealing successfully with competition policy and agriculture. In 1987, he was appointed deputy secretary general of the European Commission and became secretary general in 1997. During that time, he handled some of the most delicate budget negotiations, not least his success as head of the Dolores Task Force on German unification. In that capacity, he was the chief negotiator in the unification process between the GDR and the Federal, Federal Republic of Germany. In 1989, Carlo was appointed by Jacques Delors to represent the Commission in the International Fund for Ireland, a position he held for 11 years. In 1994, he became head of the Northern Ireland Task Force. And in that capacity, he was the architect of the Peace One package. His last posting was in Geneva as permanent representative of the European Commission to the UN organizations and EU ambassador to the World Trade Organization. And in that latter role, he was the EU negotiator on the Doha round. Neil O'Doherty is going to be our respondent today. Um, uh, so I'll introduce him now as well. Neil O'Doherty is personal professor of political science and sociology at the National University of Ireland, Galway and he is director of the new MA in public policy. He has published extensively on Northern Ireland and the conflict there on peace negotiations and on territorial conflict. His publications include Civil Rights to Armalites, a study of the escalation of conflict in Northern Ireland and Dynamics of Political Change in Ireland, co-edited with Katie Hayward and Elizabeth Meehan. 
His new book, Deniable Contact, Backchannel and Negotiation in the Northern Ireland Conflict, will be published next week by Oxford University Press. Thank you all very much for joining us. We're going to start with Carlo. And uh, Carlo, um, very much welcoming uh, your, your take on and your perspective uh, on the EU trade and cooperate, UK trade and cooperation agreement. So, Carlo, over to you. Oh, Carlo, are you there? Yeah, that's yeah right. good man. <laughs> so, okay. No, thank you very much, uh, Dan. Uh, first of all, it is uh, great to share this platform with David and uh, Katie. David and I, we go a long way back and we have similar backgrounds in the European Commission. And uh, I'm well aware of Katie's. Uh, expertise on Brexit and its impact on Ireland, both North and South. I will make some remarks from the perspective of a former EU trade negotiator. And I will add some brief comments on Northern Ireland, building on my personal involvement, you mentioned it, in the peace and reconciliation process. The EU-UK trade deal is atypical, and that is an understatement. As Pascal Lamy remarked, it is the first trade negotiation in history where both parties started from a complete free trade area and negotiated at length about barriers to erect. Boris Johnson's relentless focus on national sovereignty and taking back control has resulted in the hardest possible Brexit. The impact on business and the overall UK economy gets more and more apparent by the day. No wonder if you compare the outcome of the trade and cooperation agreement with the actual benefits of EU membership. Leaving the EU single market and custom union was a deliberate choice. While 80% of the UK economy is services-based and almost half of its total trades and goods relies on the AU, only some 13% of AU export are with the UK. The UK negotiating stance was from the outset a no-win. Moreover, it faced an uphill battle against a seasoned team of UEA, AU trade negotiators. Cherry picking efforts by dividing the common AU front failed. Michel Barnier did an excellent job by keeping member states united and the European Parliament on board. No doubt a no deal would have been the worst case scenario for both the UK and the European Union. The Trade and Cooperation Agreement at least secures no tariffs and quota on goods, a continued air, rail and maritime connectivity and a continuous flow of energy. It also provides some continued cooperation in areas of mutual interest. But compared to the pre-existing situation of British membership, the self-inflicted wounds of Brexit are considerable. To quote Bernier, Britain has simply got was what Johnson asked for. Leaving the EU single market implies the end of the free movement of persons, goods and services. UK citizens will no longer have the freedom to live, work, study and or start a business in the EU. UK service providers will have to comply with the varying rules of each member state or relocate to the EU. No more mutual recognition of professional qualifications. UK financial services firm firms will lose their financial services passport. While there will be no tariffs or quota on goods, custom declarations, rules of origins, 
health and safety checks will impose a heavy burden of red tape. While the connectivity of air and road transport remains ensured, the full freedoms of the single aviation area and the single transport market will end. UK airlines will lose existing traffic rights in the AU and only a limited number of road haulage operations will be allowed. Obviously, these consequences this also apply the other way around, but the EU is less dependent on its trades of goods with the UK, while the UK is heavily dependent on the EU service market, particularly, particularly as financial services are concerned. Both sides have tried to give a positive spin on the outcome of the TCA. The initial relief that no deal has been avoided has been overshadowed by Brexit-related disruptions in trade. Border tensions have flared up in Northern Ireland. UK casualties so far has been, have been fresh seafood exporters, the food and drink industry in general, SMEs, haulage, and logistic operators. We have seen food shortages in Northern Ireland and shared trading shifting out of London. Many creative industries, including fashion, actors and musicians, wake up at the reality that visas and work permits will be required to operate in the EU. Replicating the EU's chemical database after leaving the EU's REACH system will leave UK industry with a huge bill. Some of these disruptions may be temporary to the lack of preparation or COVID related, but most will be of a more structural nature as a mere consequence of leaving the single market. Some of the trade frictions may be dealt with within the Partnership Council and its specialized committees. So far, the detailed management of the trade deal, including the full implementation of the new trade border in the Irish Sea, has led to growing tensions between parties. The Commission swiftly overturned faux pas to activate Article 16 of the protocol on Northern Ireland has further acerbated relations. Denying the use of usual full diplomatic privilege to the EU delegation in the UK does not bode well either, bode well either for the immediate future. On the whole, the present mood is rather frosty. One may question if the cabinet level cabinet level appointment of David Frost overseeing the EU-UK partnership is a helpful step in the escalate tensions. The trade and cooperation agreement is comparable to the EU free trade agreements with Canada and Japan. It is far more ambitious on goods as it establishes duty and quota free trade from day one. On the other hand, it contains a safeguard on the level playing field by introducing the rebalancing principle. If significant divergences between parties occur in the areas of labor, social and env environmental standards, climate protection and subsidy control. Moreover, fishery is included in the agreement as access to fishery waters and market access became part of the overall deal. Both the level playing field and fisheries were until the very end major issues in the negotiations, together with the overall governance of the agreement, including dispute settlement arrangement. For the UK, the overarching objective in all these negotiations 
was taking back control. That political objective has been achieved. It remains, however, very questionable if diverging in the future from the EU rules book will serve the UK's economic interest. The EU has become worldwide a major normative power and will remain UK principal export market. Global Britain is, in my view, a far-fetched prospect. The TCA sets out detailed arrangement for joint management of shared fish stock in UK and AU waters for a transitional period of five and a half years. A compromise which has been attacked from the fish industry both in the UK and in the AU. Outside trade related and trade trade issues and trade related issues, the agreement provides for a framework of law enforcement and judicial cooperation falling short of direct real-time access to sensitive AU databases. Police forces will exchange fewer data and do so more slowly. There will be a social security coordination in a number of areas and the UK will continue to participate in some programs in the fields of research, innovation and space. It is regrettable that the UK decided not to participate in the Erasmus Plus program. The Irish Republic earmarked 2.1 million euro allowing Northern Ireland students to continue to participate in the program. On the whole, based on the political declaration in the context of the withdrawal agreement, one could have expected a broader agreement, including foreign security policies. Services, not, notably financial services, are barely covered, and there is little prospect of, er, on, of early moves by Brussels on equivalence. The TCA is to a large extent work in process and may, beginning, may be the beginning of continu continued negotiations on a wide area of subjects. In first instance, the 18 specialized committees and three working groups will deal with implementation issues. It is not likely that in the immediate future negotiation will lead to extending the scope of the trade and cooperation agreement. But eventually, parties may work towards additional bilateral agreement, as was the case in the AU-Swiss relationships. Continuing disruption of trade may force the UK to priori prioritize convergence over regular autonomy. Let me conclude with a few remarks on Northern Ireland. In a speech two years ago here in Galway, I advocated a special, special status agreement on Northern Ireland in order to protect the Good Friday Agreement in all its dimensions and to avoid a hard border. I doubt that Boris Johnson was aware of my speech but by the fall of 2019, as part of the withdrawal agreement, a protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland was signed. The protocol establishes a common travel area and keeps Northern Ireland in the EU customs union and in the internal market for goods. Economically, by all means, a very favorable solution. Being cut off the of the EU internal market would have had a devastating effect on Northern Ireland GDP. Not to mention the fact that avoiding a hard border is essential element of the 1998 Good Friday Agreement. As a consequence, we have now a trade border in the Irish Sea. Implementing the protocol 
has provoked major problems that have delayed shipments to Northern Ireland and led some companies to stop sales to the region. Moreover, it has raised tensions over the arrangements, emboldened unionist opposition to the protocol and polarized politics in the region. It is imperative to cool down the tensions and work out practical solutions to minimize administrative burden, extending grace periods and introducing flexibility may be part of it. That can only be done by common agreement. The unilateral extension of the grace period, as announced yesterday, is a violation of the protocol and undermines mutual trust. A more lasting solution would be working towards a AU-UK veterinary agreement similar to the one between the EU and Switzerland. The protocol should in any event be implemented to the full benefit of the people of Northern Ireland, enable, enabling Stormont to support it when it will vote in four years time. Thank you, Len. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carla. Uh, a lot to think about there and to follow up on. Um, and certainly financial services, amongst other things, uh, re remain a looming <clears throat> kind of question. And I'm noting your, your sense of this as a work in progress, which uh, suggests that the notion of getting Brexit done was perhaps a, a phrase that might have to be revisited. Um, David, maybe if we could uh, turn to you now, David O'Sullivan, and um, yeah, look forward to, uh, to hearing your, your thoughts and reflections on the, uh, uh, on the agreement. Yeah, thanks, Jen, and, and thank you very much to Carlo. And I, I really should not let this moment pass without just re reminding us all how much uh, Ireland owes a, a debt to Carlo for his amazing work uh, uh, in relation to Northern Ireland and the peace process uh, during his time as, as Deputy Secretary General and uh, his commitment to the country and his attempt to, to understand the complexity of our, of our politics uh, uh, does, him, does him great tribute as one of the, the greatest uh, European civil servants. Uh, and I, I find myself in, in very large agreement with everything he said, and I, I, I don't need to repeat it. I mean, to, to the question, win, lose, or compromise, I, I, I stand with Michel Barnier and Donald Tusk, both of whom said, you know, there was no happy ending to Brexit. There's no win for anyone. Uh, this is a lose-lose operation, and uh, everything we are doing is a kind of damage limitation exercise, uh, whether that was the withdrawal agreement and the protocol, or whether that was the, the TCA, which Carlo has just described in, in, in some detail. Um, unraveling uh, the deep connections between the UK and, and the rest of Europe, which had been created in the last 45 years, was always going to be a, a messy exercise. Um, Carlo quoted Pascal Lamy. I, I, I also like a phrase of Pascal, which was basically saying it was um, the UK trying to take the British egg out of the European omelet. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's a bit the way it feels at times uh, with everything that we're doing. Uh, it's all uh, very difficult, um, very complicated. And you really wonder what the, what the value added is at the end of it, other than that maybe you have made things a little less bad than they might otherwise have been. Uh, and one of the things I think will be very interesting in years to come for the academics among you will be to do a study of how we went from the Leave campaign in the 2016 referendum, which was basically about, well, we can leave the EU, but we're going to have all the benefits, everything, nothing's going to change, there's not going to be a border, there's not going to be, we will take back control, but we will have, you know, all the benefits will remain to the kind of hard Brexit that we've now ended up with, which in my view was clearly not what even uh, many of the people who voted for leave thought they were, were going to get. And yet this is, this is where we now are. Um, for Ireland, I think Brexit was always, I won't say our worst nightmare, but a, a, pretty, a pretty horrific event. Uh, the deep connections between Ireland and the UK, notwithstanding the, the tensions between us from time to time, uh, of family, history, culture, um, sim similar administrative systems meant that within the EU, we were very often on the same page, perhaps not about agriculture, as Carlo will remember from his time dealing with that difficult dossier. Uh, and, and of course, uh, joint membership of the European Union, 
in its various iterations from the time we started with the, the European community uh, when we first joined, um, greatly facilitated dialogue and contacts between Irish and British ministers, and in my view played quite a role in facilitating some of the progress we were then able to make on, on the Northern Ireland issue. Um, and of course, uh, the, you know, the issue for the South of Ireland about Brexit certainly related to um, the, the challenges of the UK closing, putting up barriers to trade with the EU. Uh, and this was, you know, even though only, you know, somewhere around 11, 12% of, of our exports now go to the UK, uh, the fact is indigenous industry was disproportionately represented by that. And, and uh, in particular, the food processing industry. Uh, and of course, a very high percentage of Ireland's trade with the rest of the EU transited through, tr transits through the UK. Uh, and therefore, the, the, the prospect of uh, tariffs, for example, in, in trade between the UK and the rest of the EU was, you know, a potential nightmare for, for Ireland. Uh, ha happily, the, the GCA has avoided that. But as, as Carlo said, uh, it has not done anything to alleviate the non-tariff barriers and the, the bureaucracy, uh, the form filling, which is now necessitated by this, this new situation. Uh, and that is why I think, for example, you're now seeing a, 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 a very rapid growth in direct travel from, uh, for freight from the Republic uh, to the continent, bypassing the, the land bridge of the UK, because that now implies a, a, a ton of additional bureaucracy and form filling, which, you know, frankly, adds no value. Now, of course, for Northern Ireland, um, there was a particular, Brexit creates a particular problem. Uh, not least because uh, even though one can debate this, and I know some on the unionist community will say, oh, no, it didn't, you know, the Good Friday Agreement had nothing to do with the EU. But the fact is, the, the rapprochement between the British and Irish governments, the uh, basically dismantling of the border uh, with uh, Northern, between Northern Ireland and the South for the purposes of goods, services uh, and people, uh, even though people, of course, are covered by the common travel area. Uh, all of that greatly facilitated the putting together of the Good Friday Agreement. And of course, the Good Friday Agreement finally, with the ceasefires, finally took away the, the, the need for a, the security need for, for a hard border on the island of Ireland. So um, the Good Friday Agreement came with a constitutional guarantee for the unionist community that the status of the province would not be changed without the agreement of the majority. Uh, the Republic took out the contentious territorial claims of Articles 2 and 3. Uh, so the Unionists could feel comforted that they were secure in their constitutional position and nationalists could feel that in practice on a day-to-day -day basis you were kind of living in a united Ireland. I mean not, not constitutionally speaking but on a practical basis there was no border. Uh, and as some people have pointed out, you know, from the days of the hard border, now when you when you tr cross the border before Brexit, you you the only thing that you knew that we were crossing a border was with the ping on your phone telling you you changed telecom provider. This was potentially jeopardized by by Brexit, and I think it's just important because with the day that's in it and the discussions that we're now having about the protocol, it is important to bear in mind that the problem for Northern Ireland with Brexit was that Brexit required that there be a border somewhere. There was going to be one uh, across the English Channel, uh, and there had to be one somehow between UK, Inc. and the Republic of Ireland, which was the entry point for the European Union. And there are only three options. One was a hard border on the island of Ireland. One was a hard border on the Irish Sea, a hard border, a, a border of sorts on the Irish Sea, Oh, and the other was a border between the island of Ireland and the rest of the EU, which I noted uh, one of the members of uh, the assembly uh, uh, gleefully suggested uh, could be the solution. Uh, obviously, uh, that solution is not going to work because that would effectively mean Ireland leaving the single market on foot of, of a British decision in which Ireland had absolutely no voice and clearly nobody in, in the Republic wants to, to leave the EU or leave the single market. You're then left with uh, a border on the island of Ireland or a border, some kind of border in the Irish Sea. And, you know, this is how we've, we've ended up here. Uh, I think everyone agreed that a, a trying to put border infrastructure back in on the island of Ireland would be hugely detrimental uh, to the progress which had been achieved. Mrs. May, in fairness to her, and I think she, she, she doesn't get enough credit for this, 
saw that the idea of a border on the Irish Sea could be problematic uh, from a, a UK constitutional point of view, could, could, could create difficulties also for those uh, in the unionist community who might see this as somehow a diff uh, distancing Northern Ireland from, from the rest of the United Kingdom. And she therefore negotiated the all, the, the all UK backstop as it was then known. In other words, trying to keep all of the UK in the customs union uh, 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 and in the single market in a way which would uh, uh, obviate the need for uh, the kind of border checks that, that we now see. This was voted down in particular by uh, uh, the DUP, uh, who uh, said that this was unacceptable. We then had uh, the arrival of Boris Johnson, and he signed up to the uh, protocol as we now have it, which in effect means a, 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 a sort of border uh, uh, in the Irish Sea or at the ports and, and, and airports of entry into Northern Ireland. Frankly, you want my personal view, I never understood how he could sign such a thing. I, I, I never understood how he could agree to it, especially since he had always you know, taken the view that it was in, in, inconceivable. Of course, we're now left with the suspicion that he may have signed it with the intention of not actually respecting it, which is uh, kind of what's what's happening at the moment. Anyway, this is this is where we've ended up. And uh, obviously, this is causing a huge amount of disruption uh, in the early days. Uh, I'd like to hear what uh, Katie has to say because she knows this much better than, than either Carla or myself. Uh, I, I am sure there is scope for uh, streamlining uh, the processes. I mean, clearly the issue at stake in the need for checks between Great Britain and Northern Ireland is the risk of products uh, who don't meet EU standards leaking into the single market via the Republic. So this is the, 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 the concept of products at risk. This is what has to be discussed. Uh, how can you exempt products which don't carry that risk from, from checks and therefore uh, minimize the impact on trade between uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland is clearly uh, one of the challenges of the Joint Committee. And I don't think this was ever fully thrashed out and still needs to be. Um, unfortunately, the unilateral action of, of the UK uh, last night is, is going to complicate things rather than uh, improve them. Uh, and we're going to have to see how we unravel that. So I, I think this is, this, is where we, this is where we now stand. And um, I mean, I think just a couple of observations, Dan, before I, I, I finish. I mean, firstly, on Anglo-Irish relations, um, I think Brexit has been hugely damaging. Um, I'm, I remember well the visit of the Queen to Ireland in, in 2011. I never thought in my lifetime, uh, after the troubles, after all the, the, the tensions, that we would see the Queen of England, United Kingdom, uh, applauded on the streets of Dublin and Cork. I thought, finally, we've laid the ghosts of the past to rest. We can move on to a mature relationship between <laughs> Two, two countries uh, comfortable in their membership of, of, of the European Union and in their future relationship. And Brexit has basically undone all of that. And I think we've moved backwards. Uh, I hope we can find a way forward again because we, we, we have to, but it's not gonna be easy. Uh, in terms of the relationship with the rest of the EU, I am afraid that this British government has consciously decided to maintain a, an approach of confrontation. Mm. Um, my deep suspicion is that they're doing this because they think it serves their domestic agenda. It plays into some of the um, highly europhobic uh, tabloid press. It plays to their base, if I may borrow a phrase from, from Trump. Uh, and it's a useful bogeyman that every time, you know, there's a problem, you just wave, you blame Brussels as, as the source of yet another irritant. And where I'd hope that the one, the, one, the one benefit of Brexit might be that the UK would feel they could stop banging on about Europe, I've discovered it's actually going to be even worse. <laughs> uh, the, uh, a, a French politician uh, in, the member, in the European Parliament, Bourlange, said, uh, before Brexit, the UK had one foot in the European Union and one foot out. After breakfast, they will have uh, one foot in and one foot out. And I think this is uh, actually what, we're, what we've got, which is that the UK will still uh, feel the need to, to engage in a, in a lot of tension creating with the, with the EU. And as Carlo has pointed out, uh, the TCA leaves unresolved many, many issues uh, on which we're going to have to continue to negotiate. 
So I think uh, I saw a commentary by Tom Wright, who's a fellow in Brookings, uh, an Irishman, but very, very well respected for security matters in Washington, who, who commented today that, you know, we could be heading to a, a sort of Japan, South Korea type relationship between Europe and the UK. In other words, one fraught with tension, which will pose problems for the US because they would like to feel that uh, uh, both the UK and the EU are their closest allies. And uh, I think the, the the tension that is then going to uh, spread from uh, the, the debates in Europe uh, to, to more global issues, uh, some of the tensions with the US, this is, this this is not going to be easy to manage. So uh, I, I must admit, uh, by way of conclusion, <laughs> um, I, I, I don't quite know what to say because I have to say I'm not particularly optimistic in the short term that it's going to be easy to get this relationship onto a more even and rational and calmer footing. Uh, and um, I don't know why the UK felt they needed to make this decision unilaterally last night um, at this point when the, 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 the discussions between uh, Marcus Seskovic and now David Frost, previously Michael Gove, have not yet been concluded. I mean, if, if really those talks were so unproductive that the UK said, we, we see no alternative other than to unilaterally do this, I might have a little bit of sympathy if they had at least made that effort, but unfortunately it seems that while the talks are ongoing, they just announced without any consultation uh, that they intend to proceed in this way. Uh, this is going to make life very, very difficult. And I fear that, um, back to your point, win, win lose or compromise, um, I, I don't know how you characterize the, the, the precise outcomes of the, of the TCA. What I do know is, uh, that we are still in for a very bumpy period in, in UK-EU relations. And unfortunately, <coughs> Ireland and Northern Ireland are going to be the, the, the meat in that sandwich and are, are, are going to feel some of the, the worst consequences of, of those differences. Thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, it's ex extremely helpful. Uh, a note of realism, I guess we could to characterize your, your, your remarks as conveying. I was thinking also as you were talking about the warnings that uh, you know, Tony Blair and John Major made, which were, uh, alas, not heeded, uh, but there were certainly some voices uh, at a very high level in terms of political experience that were noting during the referendum campaign. So that takes us to this uh, squarely to the issue of, of, of Ireland and Northern Ireland. So Katie, you know, if I could turn to you and uh, get your, your thoughts. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, thank you for the invitation to be here. And it's a great honor and privilege to be on the same panel as Carlo and David. Um, so uh, yes, it's a great title for the panel, Win, Lose or Draw, because it sort of um, helps us to try and put things in context at this particular moment when things feel very much in flux. Uh, but it's a good framework to try and analyze how things stand at the moment. So I'm going to try and utilize that to full effect. Um, so if we're trying to think about the TCA and the withdrawal agreement together, um, in some ways, how could they be framed as a win? Well, we've avoided a no deal. Um, and it's worth reflecting on the fact that we've basically spent years anticipating a no deal first and no deal exit. And then, of course, um, secondly, the idea of a no agreement on the future relationships. So the fact that we have uh, both the TCA and the withdrawal agreement it's a win in that regard, um, albeit a very on a low basis. Um, secondly, of course, it's a win in terms of avoiding a hard border on the island of Ireland. Um, and uh, again, there were many grave concerns around, as David has articulated, around what that might mean for, for Ireland north and south and avoiding a hard border on the island of Ireland, at least for the movement of goods, is a definite win. And then secondly, Oh, sorry, finally, on that point, we've also avoided a vacuum of governance. So if we'd have had a no deal, um, there would have been um, obviously legal um, uh, uncertainties as well as political and economic ones. Um, and I would um, emphasize the importance of those mechanisms for governance for the TCA and the protocol as being a definite win and ones that we should focus on more. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Interestingly enough, you have an agreement, so both sides have to be able to sell it as a win, uh, as Carlo has explained. Um, and how is the UK selling it as a win? Well, primarily, of course, it's about managing to maintain many of its red lines. 
Um, but of course, all of those red lines involve a certain degree of losses for the UK. Um, um, and those losses are beginning to be felt and experienced. And it's going to take a long time, I think, before uh, the full effect of those losses um, in real terms um, is really um, recognized and um, acknowledged, particularly at the political level. Um, and that's uh, not necessarily to be um, to be anything other than realistic about what uh, the process of Brexit um, has and will entail. But selling it as a win for sovereignty is, is, um, is a bittersweet um, approach to be taking, given what it means for unionism in particular, and I'll come back to that. So these wins have come, but at significant costs. Um, and in particular, I think what we're seeing at the moment is the cost of not having any proper uh, um, implementation period. So um, last year, um, and we need to acknowledge the very extraordinary con uh, context of um, COVID-19 and the crisis of the pandemic, last year was taken up with negotiating the future relationship. And although it was called a transition period, really we didn't know what we were transitioning into until uh, Christmas week. Um, and so as a result of that, although the EU was pretty well prepared, um, the UK wasn't, and most particularly uh, businesses in Northern Ireland and GB around operating the protocol, they were not prepared for what was to come. Uh, and there are very practical consequences to this um, and also political ones as well. Um, secondly, uh, in terms of the costs, um, and both Carla and David have alluded to this, we've had the cost of the change in the relationship between the UK and the EU. Um, the fact that um, those negotiations were pretty fraught, um, that they seem to be going nowhere uh, at the same time as having a lot of heat generated around them. Um, we've not had a move from uh, the UK and the EU uh, being um, negotiators uh, to that of being partners. And we've definitely seen this um, now with the return of Frost in particular. Um, and what he's done very rapidly and stepping into his new role is to emphasize that uh, nature of the UK EU relationship as being one about bargaining. Um, and just as an aside, um, Frost would see his decision, I think, yesterday or the decision of the UK government in relation to taking unilateral action as a win win because he can frame it as responding to the technical needs in relation to uh, implementing the protocol. And there are serious challenges and there was a need to extend the grace periods um, and to allow more time, partly because the UK, of course, didn't uh, extend the transition period. He can also sell it as a win because it's um, infuriating and aggravating the EU. Um, and uh, he's been seen to stand up to the EU um, and thus reassure unionists in particular that he's doing this. Um, and as in, in that particular framework, it's a win-win. Of course, this is only viewing it in very short term, uh, uh, um, in a very short term framework. Um, and that's the kind of, that reflects the, the nature, I think, of, of the current government, that it's still in that sort of uh, campaigning bargaining mode rather than any sense of responsibility longer term over this. Um, for what it's worth, I don't think this puts the protocol in, in crisis um, because these moves are very much about actually implementing the protocol uh, rather than uh, setting it aside. Finally, in relation to this, we do have a problem in that there's no ownership of the protocol per se, um, particularly not on the UK side um, and certainly not within Northern Ireland. Nobody really wanted the protocol. Either people didn't want to leave the EU or they didn't want the new arrangements that the protocol bring into play. Um, and we do therefore have a problem when it comes to um, managing what is an extremely huge adjustment and a very great change in uh, Northern Ireland's relationship with Britain, um, as well as of course now being outside of the EU with Ireland as well. So just to turn to the protocol and think of that in, in the win-lose draw analysis, the problem that we have at the moment is that it's possible to have a zero sum interpretation of what the protocol means. So for Remainers, Remainers have lost, 
Northern Ireland is outside of the European Union. And for unionists, they see, um, many of them anyway, see the protocol as being a lose for unionism. Um, and the zero sum analysis comes in relation to the decision as to where to draw that hard border. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we have a win, we've avoided a hard Irish land border. The loss is a hard Irish sea border. And um, uh, this of course speaks to um, really provokes sense of insecurity in the unionist position. Partly we can, it could, it's possible to blame the EU for that, blame the Irish government, and we're seeing an awful lot of that um, around and about. But also this is exacerbated by the fact that unionists do not trust the UK government. We see trust rates and approval rates of Boris Johnson being incredibly low. But more to the point, the protocol is there because the UK government decided to prioritise a hard Brexit over the union in many ways, as, as David has already um, spelled out. And this is, of course, um, extremely concerning for unionism and hence uh, some of the reason why we've seen what we've seen in the last few days and weeks. Um, stability for the protocol and for Northern Ireland more broadly depends on avoiding a situation in which uh, the future of Northern Ireland and this whole debate can be seen as being a question of the union of the UK versus the, the European Union. And if the EU's actions are being able to be framed as um, undermining the union, then we do have a problem in Northern Ireland. So that, that thing that we've we always feared, if you like, or many of us did, that the fundamental division within Northern Ireland can be um, seen to be overlaid by the EU versus UK uh, relationship, um, that, that's at risk of actually coming to pass. And obviously this is particularly um, uh, discomforting to the Irish government in particular. The protocol in and of itself is a draw. It's a, it's a compromise um, and it'll, be, it'll continue to be a source of great discomfort and unease uh, to both sides. Um, both for practical reasons, given the huge adjustment that it is uh, to Northern Ireland um, and also in, in political terms as well. So to conclude, I just want to draw some lessons uh, from the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, because um, I think the protocol is by far the most significant legal agreement for Northern Ireland and Ireland since uh, the Good Friday Agreement. And um, 20 years after the event, we should be able to take some lessons. And I think as an international agreement, it is kind of relevant here. So we see in an agreement of this nature, it can be sold differently by the different sides. That's perfectly understandable. That's almost inevitable in an agreement uh, that was involving diff difficult negotiations. But what is important is that relationship between, if you like, the co-guarantors. Um, and at the moment, as I say, we have a problem in that, in particular, the UK sees its relationship with the EU as one of negotiation and bargaining rather than one of joint responsibility. The sooner the UK and the EU see themselves as co-guarantors of the protocol and the compromise that that entails, uh, the better. Another lesson is perhaps the need to make sure that this agreement is seen as legitimate. As I say, nobody owns that agreement in Northern Ireland at the moment. Um, and uh, there are concerns about the legitimacy of the protocol that will not be amended by the consent vote in the assembly at the end of 2024. So legitimacy, and I, just to say it very briefly, it's about you know, who's involved in decision-making, who's around the table, what kind of decisions are being made, are they in the general interests of people uh, in Northern Ireland, and then how are those decisions being made and then implemented, and there are major concerns in relation to that for the for the protocol and following on from that we need to use full we need to make full use of those institutions and mechanisms that are there for the governance of the protocol um, and we've, this is a lesson from the good friday agreement as well that full use wasn't made of all the elements that the pro, that the agreement contained for example the north south civic forum never got established um, the tca governance mechanisms are highly complicated um, the governance of the protocol, those mechanisms are um, arguably inadequate, um, but there's still a lot of potential there to um, help enhance the legitimacy of the protocol um, um, in terms of how decisions are made that affect Northern Ireland. 
Um, and then finally, another lesson from the Good Friday Agreement is about expecting, anticipating and being committed to continued innovation and flexibility. Um, the protocol is highly unusual and in many ways that reflects the highly unusual situation of Northern Ireland. Absolutes don't work. So you can't have the question of the full integrity of the European Union stretching to include a uh, single market stretching to include Northern Ireland, just as you can't have a very simplistic understanding of sovereignty stretching to include Northern Ireland and, and, and expecting it to work. So ultimately, uh, we are in a very critical moment and coming through this um, in a way that um, causes least disruption uh, to the Good Friday Agreement, and which also helps the um, full implementation of the protocol in the longer term, depends on the long view being taken. Um, and I will leave it there. Thank you. Well, thank you, Katie, that, uh, for the immense clarity there, I think was extremely helpful. Um, so I guess if everybody can you know, turn on your cameras, we'll sort of rejoin. Um, Katie, I had a quick sort of follow-up uh, with you. I wonder if I might start with uh, asking about Theresa May and uh, David referred to her. Do you think that there will be some cause for regret um, in the DUP of not having perhaps taken the opportunity that was once available uh, that had been provided by Theresa May's work, uh, work around, if I can put it that way? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't work that way. Well, partly because even if the DUP had supported uh, the first version of the withdrawal agreement, um, I don't, the ERG would have regret, rejected it. Um, the, the DUP also rejecting it helped, um, but they rejected it because of the special arrangements for Northern Ireland rather than what it meant for the UK. And, uh, and that's still the principle upon which they object to the protocol. Um, so, you, I mean, you're right, it would have certainly meant the sea border would have been much less significant, uh, but in and of itself, they, um, that just having to make that choice was one that they, they, they wouldn't want to put their imprimatur on the yeah. support. I suppose it comes back to the fact that Brexit is this extraordinary political puzzle, which it thwarts at every turn <laughs> the available solution. So that 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 in a sense doesn't go away. We've had some some a few questions have come in, and uh, David, I had a question for you, uh, and I, I think I might know the answer based on your remarks. But one of our, our attendees has asked whether the UK will uh, perhaps rejoin uh, the European uh, Union. Are you optimistic or pessimistic on that one? No, I'm, I'm not particularly optimistic uh, in any sort of meaningful time frame. Um, uh, I, I think there could be an evolution of, of thinking, but I, 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 I think, you know, it's, it's not even worth speculating about. Uh, uh, um, it's something that, you know, might 10, 15, 20 years from now down the road might, might come back on the agenda because I think, um, the, 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 the natural, I mean, the reasons which led the UK in the 60s to decide to, to, to join the European project, having initially remained aloof from it, remain, remain identical to, to, to what they were then. In other words, the UK would have uh, uh, enhanced uh, um, uh, standing globally, uh, would be better able to influence, you know, important decisions being taken in Europe, which impact directly on, on, on the UK's interests. But I think we're, we're so far down the road now of confrontation and, and sort of seeing this as a moment of liberation and so forth, that it's going to take at least a generation to, 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 to make that turn if it ever happens. That, that seems like a very fair assessment, I must say. Uh, Carlo, there's a question that has come in. I wonder if I could direct to you a very interesting um, question about what what would happen now if foot and mouth disease broke out again <laughs> in Ireland? This, the disease affected uh, the UK, Ireland, and the Netherlands, so you're kind of in an interesting position. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. How, 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 how could this be handled under the present circumstances? You were mentioning, of course, you know, EU and Switzerland and, uh, yeah, and veterinary uh, agreements and so forth, so I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. No, well, within the European Union, if there is foot and mouth uh, disease, it is uh, very possible and in most cases very likely that there are border controls between the regions. So I don't think it is a specific uh, problem. But I have a, uh, a remark to make. 
maybe a question to Katie or to others. If you look at the present difficulty with the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol, it is focused on, uh, on SPS and especially on veterinary points. There is no immediate need for the UK to change their rules, their rules, which are at the moment identical to the EU rules. So couldn't one imagine that you say for, for a number of years, we agree that we keep the rules the same. So no divergence from the UK, from the SPS rules of the EU uh, rule book. That would solve whole, the whole problem immediately. And it wouldn't imply uh, that it is at odds with taking back control, because I don't think there is an, any immediate need for the UK to de diverge from, from the rule book of the EU on SPS and, and especially veterinary rules. Yes, so it's a good question. And I have heard unionists um, and loyalists um, urging some kind of SPS agreement of the sort of Swiss style. Um, but ultimately we come back to that question of how much is the UK prepared to give on that? Certainly, I mean, the, the grace periods um, depended on the unilateral declaration of the UK to say that it will continue to follow the EU's rules and won't diverge. Um, and uh, that will continue to be the case. Um, so that's what's enabled those grace periods to be there at the present moment. But I don't see, I don't see the UK being willing to follow those rules for any longer than it needs to do so, and not for Northern Ireland, you know. Um, and uh, I think, you know, if you look at what's already happening in terms of consultations and expectations vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the UK um, standards, so we're seeing movements in relation to pesticides and also in relation to gene editing in plants. Um, so this is a, seen as, you know, one thing that can be done because we're now free of the EU rules. Um, now, we know that those won't be able to um, come into Northern Ireland, that that will actually put a, more impediments on movement of good into Northern Ireland. But that's a kind of sell, a kind of win um, uh, in an, an otherwise fairly stark um, environment uh, with us many lacks of wins in terms of being able to show well we've diverged in this particular way so I would be extremely surprised if the UK does agree to such an agreement even though it makes it does make a lot of sense. Thanks very much there are a couple of other questions have come in that I might ask uh, David about one is about American influence and how how this might Play. I mean, we're dealing with such an unstable situation, but you've come from that recent uh, responsibility on the EU's behalf and in an American context, there's been a change of administration. What's your, your take on, on the, the US role? Look, I, I, I think to, to two observations. I mean, one, you know, they are not gonna to wanna to get in the middle of this, right? Uh, basically, you know, they're gonna see this as an intra-European squabble uh, and, um, they will want to try and have good relations with 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 both of us, with the EU and and with its member states and with the UK. Um, they will try not to be, you know, caught up in it. Um, I I think they. The second point, however, is that there's no doubt about it, and it should not be underestimated. President Biden deeply feels his Irish connections. Um, the Irish lobby is very real. The support for the, the Good Friday Agreement, the Americans consider themselves, Richie Neal and others and the Friends of Ireland uh, in Congress, consider themselves co-guarantors of, of, this, of this arrangement. So there will be great concern at anything which appears to, to jeopardize the peace process and, and the reconciliation and all that, that goes with it. So they will be trying to, I think, exercise uh, uh, influence and a calming, a calming voice. Um, and their influence will be will be considerable on 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 both sides, I think, of the of the equation. But you know, how much they're going to want to get involved in you know SPS issues or trying to uh, figure out how you make how you make the seawater work in in a less uh, um, difficult way for 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 Northern Ireland consumers, uh, I think that they'll be very cautious in in getting into that level of granularity. To be honest. 
Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. I think there's certainly some interesting opportunities there. And of course, there's the UK-US trade agreement. And I think there's a kind of uh, time frame there, which seems quite short for, for serious progress to happen before that. I take it there would have to be new legislation. So I don't know if you're, you have any quick thoughts on, on that. The I, I don't think there will be a, a, a trade deal, you know, this side of TPA, which expires uh, in, in June. Um, so, you know, you're looking 2023, 2024, probably optimistically, uh, uh, realistically. I mean, I see today the UK reached a, a, a bilateral arrangement with the, the US on the Airbus tariffs, uh, which is the first sign of a sort of slightly divert, you know, differential approach between the UK versus uh, EU partners. Interesting, given the the implication of, of Airbus, you know, the, the UK industry in Airbus. I mean, I'm not, not entirely sure how that works. Uh, but so the, the Americans will, on occasion, when it suits them, they will try to play EU against UK, UK against EU. That's that's part of their toolbox. Uh, but I, I don't see a, a trade deal happening anytime soon. Mm. I mean, my own view is that that, that, that uh, this, they're better off dealing with Biden, at least in terms of stability and the idea that you get a good deal with <laughs> Donald Trump seems to be an extravagant fantasy, but uh, that's another subject <laughs> for another day. Carl, I had a quick question for you. And, and that's, my sense is that the UK is, is benefiting from prior trade agreements that the EU has made with other countries, and it's kind of piggybacking on those agreements. Is that a fair characterization of hey, yeah. going <laughs> What the UK is doing is uh, copy and paste uh, all the all the agreements with which the EU has FTAs yeah. which has the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> I'm reassured in a sense, but these are naturally presented as 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 victories, and there's no, there's nothing against that. But I there's think there's nothing the wrong with that. Eh? Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, yeah, it's perfectly legitimate, but it gets played out politically, of course, in a certain kind of way. I wanted to come to uh, to, to Neil now, and you have this unenviable task of uh, you know making some summary comments. And uh, we've run a little bit over time, but please do take 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 a moment to to give us your thoughts and, and reflections on this this complicated problem. I think that we've had some wonderful contributions today, so lo lots to consider. Yeah, it's been fantastic, and I'll keep it very brief given time constraints. Um, uh, what I get from the overall discussion is that, uh, uh, as David said, we were heading for a lose-lose scenario in any case, but um, I think it was really nice the way Katie put it, that we essentially we didn't lose as badly as we might have lost, and that's something heartening to, to bear in mind. It wasn't quite the dis as disastrous as it, it might have been, so there's something to salvage there. I'll just ask one question of the panelists, which is, do do you think the benefits of the Northern Ireland Protocol, so the, the disadvantages are evident in everyday life in recent weeks, do you think the benefits of the protocol can become clear in people's everyday lives sufficiently to, to, make, to make a difference when it comes to the vote at Stormont to build popular support around continuance of the protocol? And what might those benefits be? That, that will people will see in the next three years or so before that vote in storm. Well, yeah, Carlo, no. Yeah. I think we have to look also at the economics perspective. In the discussion so far, uh, Katie put, put a lot of focus on the political perspective for the very reason that the, U, U, the UP has a political, exclusively political perspective in this issue. But if you look at the economic perspective, since uh, 1998, since the Good Friday Agreement, one can say that you have a development of an all island economy. And that started maybe already before, but since 98, it has accelerated. You have an all island economy. Secondly, and Katie made the remark, you have to look at the interest of the people of Northern Ireland, not specifically to the political parties of Northern Ireland, but the interest of the people of Northern Ireland. And I think there is, there is a majority amongst the people of Northern Ireland, and even in Stormont, there is a majority of the need of continuing uh, being part of the internal market and continuing being part of the custom union. 
because a majority of the people and certainly all the enterprise realize that continuing being part of internal market and custom unions is very important for the well-being of enterprises and the people of Northern Ireland. So in my view, the main objective of implementing the protocol of Northern, Northern Ireland is to make sure that both the people and the ent enterprises of Northern Ireland take the full, full profit of it. Katie, I don't know if you wanted to uh, yeah, offer your, your, your thoughts on this. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, so I just say three things. So first and foremost, like the output legitimacy of the protocol is very weak because, you know, the best way you could put it at the moment is, well, it could have been a lot worse um, and that's not going to sell it to many people. So um, particularly this time, all we're seeing is losses and disruption rather than benefits. Uh, so, so that's the sense of the moment. The all island economy, absolutely, there are opportunities there, but I, I think we're yet to see or appreciate quite how significant Northern Ireland being outside of the EU is. So yes, inside the single market for goods, but being outside for services, et cetera, will have a, a negative effect. So um, that's sort of um, another thing to bear in mind. But finally, it is true that some people are seeing opportunities for Northern Ireland um, and seeing potential benefits. But it always comes back to that question of political stability. So some businesses are saying, like in GB, yeah, let's, you know, Northern Ireland is in that unique position, free access to the GB market, free access to the single market. But why would you want to go and invest there at this particular moment when things seem so uncertain? So I'd almost imagine we won't really, I mean, hope, I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think we'll necessarily see that come into pass until after the 2024 vote, which is obviously just the first vote. And then people sort of say, okay, um, this, at least we have at least the next four years, hopefully even eight years, to be able to invest in Northern Ireland and then we reap the potential benefits of this protocol. Oh, that's, that's a great point about uh, questions of investment. Uh, David, I don't know if you had any 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 final thoughts. No, just to observe, I mean, I agree, I agree with you, Katie. I mean, I think I think unfortunately, Neil, the, the, the benefit is likely to be in a time frame which slightly extends beyond the the, the, the four-year rendezvous because it will be about investment choices. Uh, and I think potentially Northern Ireland could become very attractive, but the, the politics need to follow. I, I do think if I may just, I mean, since we're in Galway, I mean, I, I think there's a, there's a huge responsibility also in the South uh, not to over talk this whole talk about border pole and reunification and all of that. I mean, this is what's deeply destabilizing to the unionist community because they do see Northern Ireland somehow having a semi-detached status now, which is the sort of anti-room to, to, to reunification, which is what some people are talking it up as. I don't think, you know, this may happen, it may not happen. Uh, we have a long way to go. I think the approach of, of the government and, and the shared island approach, and let's try and figure out, you know, with the constitutional situation as it is, how we make this island work to the benefit of everyone is, is the right approach. So I think continually talking as though United Ireland is now sort of inexorable and inevitable, and it's just a matter of whether it's five or 10 years or 15 years is deeply unhelpful in this situation. We should all just learn to live with what we have, make it a success of it, and then leave to, I won't say future generations, but leave to you know later years that the decisions that may present themselves uh, in, in the future. And I think really this is uh, contributing to some of the problems we're now, some of the backlash we're now seeing in the unionist community, and we need to be sensitive to that. Oh, thank you very much, and 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 the, thank you, thanks to all of you. It's been a fascinating discussion. I've learned an enormous amount, and I think you've really sharpened our thinking about the the challenges um, <clears throat> that we're facing. Notes of realism about how to reflect on this in the context of you know win win lose or draw as a way of framing reflections on it, not to not to be excessively um, uh, utopian in what we think might have been possible in this scenario, but also to think uh, carefully about what what the future holds. Uh, so just remains for me to thank you once again for participating and indeed for our audience uh, today. So on behalf of, <clears throat> of, of Neil and the MA in Public Policy and the Moore Institute, uh, thank you again.